be interesting for everyone to see how kind of like we start started with the studies and our educational background and see how this had an impact on our work and our research today. And then in the end, talk a bit about the role of teaching in our work uh, and how this informs our practice and vice versa. I think it's kind of like always an interesting discussion, the relationship between practice and teaching. So we will start with my, with the studies. So as Shada said before, like both my partner Eric Martinez and I, we did our master's degrees in the University of Stuttgart at the Institute of Computational Design and Construction. And uh, this is also how we met, we met Shada and everything kind of like started. Um, after I finished my uh, bachelor in architectural background, I was very curious about advanced technologies and you know how these influence the way we design and we inhabit spaces today. So a master program that was focused on uh, robotic fabrication and computational design was something that I was looking for. And um, in the first year of the program, we collectively designed and fabricated this um, 40 feet cantilever structure made out of glass and carbon fiber. Uh, this pavilion aimed to show the potential of this material system to construct larger scale, lightweight structures using a multi robot fabrication system. So as you can see in the picture here, we had to cover a very long span and we used two robotic arms, one at each end of the structure in order to anchor each fiber on the frame. And then there was a drone that was transferring the fiber from one robot to the other. So we kind of like used the strength and precision of robotic arms um, in order to place and tension the fibers on the frame. And the drone, it was used as, you know, taking advantage more of the frame movement um, that allowed us to transfer a slack fiber among the stationary robots. So there was this collaborative fabrication system that consisted of a multi-species of robots that we developed um, this year. And, and after this project, I was actually really fascinated about this kind of like collaborative fabrication systems. Um, but I was kind of like interested in exploring more of the role of the human in the process of designing and making. So for my thesis, um, I was interested in exploring the potential of using uh, user interfaces and sensor feedback to develop an intuitive design and fabrication process for granular jamming, so a completely different material system uh, than the year before. So granular jamming is basically the physical process uh, when we have like particles that can transition between a liquid-like to a solid-like material state. Um, in our case, we use this kind of like polypropylene membrane bags that were filled with wood shavings and we applied vacuum in order to jam the bags and solidify the material. You can understand it, I think, a bit better here in the video. Um, in our fabrication scenario, you see that the material was soft and malleable in the beginning. It's just like a bag with wood chips. And then the users had the chance to form the material since it was still soft. Now, when they achieved the form that was desired, they would just vacuum the bag and that would become very stiff. Then we would seal the bag and we would solidify the design and keep it frozen there. Um, after the formation process, the users scanned the component using a Vive controller in order to create a digital model of the physical object that they made. So the user could hold the handset and move it along the pieces you see now in the video, and they would record specific points on that object. So the points would transfer to the digital environment um, and they were used to create the form piece using a very simple physics simulation engine in a grasshopper. And then we would, after this process, after this recording and simulation process, we would kind of like end up with an appro approximate geometry of the um, physical object that was produced. Precision was not something that was um, desired or needed in this case, so we did uh, have a lot of like tolerance and affordances in this case. Uh, and here you see the actual interface. Um, the digital model that was produced was saved in a computational library using a custom-made UI user interface. And the goal of the project was to collect all the data from previous users and make them accessible 
to the future ones, assisting in designing and constructing their own structure. So it was more about kind of like opening up all the possibilities and see what previous users are doing, showing it to the future ones to help them kind of like being creative and innovative using this interface. The broader vision uh, was to create a fabrication system through human computer interaction that could lead to crowdsourcing, democratization in design processes, and then each user can contribute design iterations in this common library uh, that will be accessible by other users. Um, why I'm showing all that, I think it's important to know the background, especially um, for students that are still in their studies to understand the connection between studies and work, professional work and research, future research. Um, so like after finishing the studies in Germany, um, I was really um, interested in finding new ways of combining this knowledge and the skills that I got in advanced manufacturing technologies with um, a personal interest in speculative humanistic architecture scenarios. And this was the focus when we started our practice. Uh, some people, so some people is a research oriented practice. Um, we do like small scale projects where we explore the potential of using cutting edge tools in order to achieve a human centered uh, sustainable architecture that addresses issues of um, social agency and human experience. So through public art installations and exhibitions and workshops, we investigate innovative ways to broaden the use of these technologies, not only now for material efficiency and structural performance, but moving into also um, engaging the public, intriguing human curiosity and encouraging interaction. So this was the main goal to kind of like move a bit further uh, from uh, the more performative and efficient uh, goals that we had before into more uh, social and, and uh, interactive and engaging uh, processes. Uh, as you see in this diagram here, we have three main cores of our work, um, technology, materiality and human agency. And for each core, we identify specific tools like actual digital and physical tools. And these tools kind of like keep on growing with uh, new projects that we get and also how technology moves. Um, and the main cores, you see that they interact with each other, creating our three large fields of action, uh, as we call them for our practice, which are basically our main focus and interest, um, democratization of technology, intuitive making processes and collaborative fabrication systems. Um, for every project that we get, we try to see if there is an opportunity to innovate in these fields using some of the tools in different combinations. Um, this coding system that you see here is basically a map for us that helps us navigate through our work and evaluate our projects under the larger scope of uh, our practice. In this presentation, I will show you two projects of each field of action so that you get an idea that I think is going to be very holistic and a holistic idea about what in general we're doing in the practice. So I will start with the issue of democratizing and demystifying technology in urban environments. Um, this is our project Sky Gazing Tower. Um, it's a public installation designed for LA Design Festival. Um, it addresses the challenges of contemporary global lifestyles. So we were thinking about social anxiety and agoraphobia. And we wanted to provide personal space uh, for the public to decompress when they are in a very intense and crowded urban environment. So um, we combine this installation with a virtual reality environment that helps users personalize their private space and design their own tower that uh, maybe responds better to their own needs. 
So the installation gives space and time to each individual to stir at the sky alone while being surrounded by a hanging translucent orange membrane that diffuses the light and creates a soothing environment. The installation consists of a wide steel frame and vinyl orange membrane strips that hang loosely from the top ring. The membrane strips cover the upper part of the visitor body, leaving the lower part uh, visible to the public, making clear that the tower is occupied at the moment. So the translucency of the membrane allows a subtle connection with the external environment, while at the same time, though, provides a place of retreat. And this is this kind of a balance that we wanted to have, that you're not completely isolated. You can still look at the sky. You can still have some visual contact with your surroundings, but also create some uh, privacy when it's needed. So the design of the structure starts from a uh, very classic, maybe you've seen that before, or like you've uh, you've seen it in your studies at some point. There is this very classic uh, proxemics diagrams of the 60s, uh, where psychologists drew boundaries of every person's, um, they call it intimate, personal and social space. So they are basically, like if you see yourself uh, from the top, like uh, in the top view, you see some offsetting circles around your body, which supposedly define your personal boundaries. Um, so we try to challenge this kind of like universal approach of personal space, where it is considered that each one of us, that we are supposed to feel comfortable in the same specific space. Uh, which for us didn't make a lot of sense. We thought that there are a lot of like cultural, personal, emotional issues, social issues that kind of like make uh, different people feel comfortable in very different environments. So we wanted to create a virtual, um, in a virtual reality environment, giving uh, the visitors of the festival the opportunity to virtually modify the structure and define their own personal space according to their needs and preferences. So visitors can experience the installation in a simulated, crowded urban environment, and then they can redesign the tower until they feel comfortable in it. Each visitor can change the size, color, and materiality of the tower using this user interface that you see on uh, the screen right now. Um, this guides them basically step by step um, during like the whole design process until they achieve the result um, that is satisfying for them. You can see now actually the interface, um, this is the VR tool in action. Um, the user has the chance to scale the structure, change its proportions. Um, they can also modify the number of strips and the size of those. Um, and they can also change the color and the translucency and the reflectivity of the material. And after they are kind of like finalizing their design and they see that they feel comfortable in this environment. I didn't have sound here, but there was also sound of cars and people moving. Um, so we really try to like create the whole experience of being uh, in a crowded urban environment and um, so that they can kind of like more accurately um, have a design that responds to their needs. And after they finish and they finalize their design, they can move on and save their iteration. So these iterations were saved as numeric data in a computational library, allowing us to see the variety of designs that reflect people's preferred personal space. So this is an example of all some of these uh, design iterations that came out, out of that process. So there is this kind of like family of structures that emerge using the digital tool. Um, and our hope was that this tool would embrace human diversity and personal expression and understand that different people might have different needs and different aesthetics. Um, and allow them to explore the personal and intimate and social space and redefine the boundaries and the aesthetics of them and not assume that all of us need the same space and the same kind of boundaries um, in each occasion. Um, now I'm going to move to our latest project, which is called Happy Stripe. It is a winning proposal for a site-specific installation in downtown Frederick. It's in Maryland in the States. 
Um, it aims to activate a narrow alley by stimulating passerby's curiosity and encouraging them to walk beneath it. Um, for this project, um, we designed an augmented reality uh, gaming app that allows users to digitally interact with the structure and with each other uh, while it enables them to play together safely. So you see here is this kind of like playful linear structure made out of bent steel frame and hanging nylon ropes. It acts basically as a vibrant stripe that highlights the urban and architectural characteristics of this specific large, super narrow, uh, long alley. Um, and at the same time, kind of like try to create a dialogue with the existing context. As you can see also here in the top view, um, the spline geometry of the frame is kind of like a reference to the arches of the neighboring buildings windows and there is this kind of like very specific facade ornamentation that maybe you can see a bit here that we were referring to the structure is tilted emphasizing the depth of the alley in perspective and the color of the installation relates to the color of the brick facades around it so you see that there is kind of like red brown brownish brick color that it becomes much brighter more vibrant pinkish color um, as the strip enters the alley you can also see that the hanging ropes bring this kind of like porosity in the structure that creates very playful shadows uh, that change throughout the day now what is the interesting thing about this project that i want to bring up is that we won this competition in december 2019 right before COVID. And the initial plan was that this structure would be part of the local spring festival in the city that actually attracts a lot of visitors and tourists there and it's a very big event for the city. So when that was the case, our proposal was that we would create an AR app as part of the installation that would engage the public uh, physically and digitally and it would kind of like become a guide, a virtual guide, this app for the festival, providing useful information for the city. Of course, as you can imagine, all of these plans were cancelled, as well as the festival itself. And we found ourselves designing a public installation in a period when basically no one felt safe walking in public space, even ourselves. So our question was, how can we take advantage of the virtual part of the installation since the physical one was already designed and got the permits and we didn't really have control over the design anymore, but take advantage of the virtual part of this installation in order to attract and engage people with our structure. And at the same time, though, encourage social distancing and keep everyone safe. Um, and while everything was happening, um, the restaurant that you see in the right side of this photo got permission to have tables for outdoor dining in the alley right beneath our structure. So a lot of things were happening and changing at that point, and these tables were placed six feet apart for social distancing under the structure. And then for us as architects, it started becoming a bit interesting, the relationship between the circular diagram of social distancing in public spaces and the curved geometry that we had already designed for our structure. And we started exploring the idea of using these abstract circles as the base of an AR game. So these were some initial sketches of how that could work introducing some colorful balls that would drop from the sky into the structure. Uh, and these were kind of like initial thoughts that we had. And this is how it ended up looking like. Um, it is a multiplayer game where you drop the balls towards the structure, trying to fill up the canopy um, as much as you can with these colorful balls. Um, we created both an AR and a web version to give the opportunity to everyone to explore the structure without having to be physically there. Um, a lot of people didn't feel comfortable walking in public and this could be a way for them to experience the structure safely. Um, we thought that using this media now could be a way to make our installation more inclusive and more accessible to everyone. And at the same time, since it's a multiplayer game, 
uh, players can see and interact with each other while playing. And that would also be something uh, that we were aiming for creating this kind of like digital community uh, where people can interact safely, at least, you know, um, in the instance. Uh, so yeah, this is actually an app that you can download uh, in your, your phone. It's in the Apple Store. You can use the QR code or you can just uh, type on Apple Store, Happy Stripe AR, and it will come up and you can download and play with that. Um, and here um, you can see how it works um, in the web version. So this is what you it would look like if you just stream it on the web. You have this kind of like interface that helps you, uh, explains to you how you can move around. It's pretty intuitive the way you can move around, uh, either keyboard or mouse, and then you can just click and start throwing balls. It's not very easy to actually manage to have the balls on the and in the canopy and in the structure, but that's part of the game. And of course, um, in this case, I'm just like, uh, it's a very, very simple case with one just player just to show you how that works. You see that, okay, I managed at some point to have some balls in there. You see that the score is also kind of like, uh, counts the balls that are placed inside the structure. And yeah, the, they, they later do disappear. Uh, and this is the version of uh, that you would have in your phone. You choose an avatar. Uh, you are, let's say, at home. You just need to define. Oh, sorry about the lagging of the video. Um, so you just need to define the um, a surface where you can uh, actually place and orient the structure, and uh, you can just start playing. I mean, it's really bad, the quality right now. I know it's maybe a bit heavy, the video, but um, in on the phone is actually much more intuitive, the whole interface. And I think it's much more fun when you have a lot of people joining and they play together. And I think it's much more uh, fun as an experience, but uh, up to each player to decide how they want to do this. Um, so yeah, I, now moving from this kind of like approach on like how do we use tools in order to engage people, in order to make our process and our design more inclusive and more accessible um, and, and demystify the use of these tools. Um, I would like now to move to another uh, part of our research that uh, is focusing on the collaborative fabrication systems uh, that usually we investigate remote robotic manufacturing and innovative tectonic systems through that. Um, so Stack It, that's the name of this project. Um, it's a project that we developed when we were inviting by Anahuac University in Mexico City to give a workshop on robotic fabrication uh, utilizing their new Fab Lab space. So they had just created their new robotic lab with two large arms, and they wanted us to do a project there in order to show to the students the potential of that space. The project explores the potential of robotic technology to assemble wooden structures through a collaborative workflow between robots and builder. So a large scale prototype was constructing uh, using these two six axis robotic arms. Uh, the material system uses these linear elements, timber elements that are assembled in an additive manner. The pieces are picked and brought into position by the robots using a pneumatic reaper and they're screwed together manually. The length of these pieces are, is very important because this is how we kind of like enable the collaboration between the two robots because they were placed very far away from each other and they couldn't really collaborate before. We did like a series of designs where we started exploring the design space of this specific setup that they had in the lab, uh, which was actually pretty limited because of this kind of like the, the, the workspace of the robots did not overlap. Um, and the final design consists of two, two sorry, different modules, a straight and an angled piece. It's a very easy and straightforward system. So we have two um, existing pneumatic grippers that were hacked in order to offer support and counterbalance, as you can see um, in the in the image here. So we kind of like hacked that 
so that um, we can have this kind of like counterbalance for the long pieces as they were transferred um, in a specific location. So each row of the structure had two identical elements placed simultaneously by the two robotic arms. Um, by placing each element in the right position, the robots were basically indicating to us the location of the connections. So they were bringing them in place, then we would know where to go and drill the very simple connections that we had. And then before releasing the pieces, we would screw everything in place and then the robot would release the piece and move on to the next one. Here you can see the fixtures, they're super simple angles, basically screwed manually while the robot holds every piece in place. And this collaborative process was repeated with the robots placing each element in place, indicating to us the location of the connections. The challenge of the project was, as I said before, the given setup and the fact that the two arms were placed far away from each other, limiting the design space for the project. However, this was also the driving force, I think, for the final design, because these limitations can always be an opportunity uh, for creating different kinds of designs. Um, and that's why we ended up with kind of like very long and linear elements that allowed e the robots to reach each other. Um, now we followed a similar approach when we were selected by the Telin Architecture Biennale to submit a proposal um, as finalists of their installation competition. You might probably know about that. It's a competition that speculates about the future of design and manufacturing. Um, our proposal was a timber structure that emerges from an in-situ human-robot collaboration. So the topic of the competition was primitive hat, and uh, we explored how the geological, human, and industrial evolution brought us to what we call today the Anthropocene and Industry 4.0. Uh, we investigate the transformation of the primitive hat to the post-digital hat in regard to the materials, technologies, and dwelling concepts in order to conclude to our own uh, architectural strategy for this project. In our proposal, we use local and vernacular materials um, to create adaptive, an adaptable tec tectonic system, um, and we were thinking about you know finding ways to put together this material with a very intuitive in situ collaborative fabrication and assembly process. So we actually proposed a live showcase during the Biennale to show the potential of you know demystifying all of those technologies and the importance of human participation in the construction of public spaces and how empowering that can be. Uh, for the citizens. So the tectonic system is uh, pretty simple. Um, it questions the basic typologies of wood construction. So we usually have this um, surface versus frame tectonics. Um, and But in this case, we wanted to create a scheme and a facade that acts both as facade and structure at the same time. So we want to take advantage of different types of manufactured wood. We have this linear lumber 4x4 beams that achieve this double curved complexity of the truss system. And then we have the thin 3 millimeter beach plywood sheets that form the bent closure panels that you see on top of the truss. Uh, so the space stress is fabricated with five axis milling of the complex 3D joinery. This is the most complicated part, how all the beams come together, basically. Uh, and this is what allows us to build this doubly curved surface, uh, the toroid surface that you see. Um, and the curvature of the exterior panel is achieved through bending. So we'll just bend in place the um, panels on top. A human robot collaborative process is employed in this case, um, and we thought that we could take advantage of the precision and speed of machining complex joinery while using human cognition and intuition uh, to assemble and manipulate the trusses and bent panels. 
So you can see here the setup a bit more clearly. You can read it left to right. So the robot picks up the strat, mills the joints using a bandsaw, and brings it in place for assembly by humans. The bent panels were then fixed manually on the wood beams. Each radial segment of the toroid is prefabricated off-site, transferred and assembled on-site. A prefabricated metal ring on the ground would guide the installation of each segment and support the structure during construction. Now, the toroidal structure of our proposal reveals its material and fabrication process very gradually as it is approached by visitors. So you see that the outside reads basically as a solid bubbly structure and it starts revealing itself as you go inside and then you start seeing this densely populated curved timber lattice. So here visitors would witness and participate in the cutting edge robotic fabrication process. Our goal was to show the importance of human participation and engagement in the construction of public structures um, and demystify the use of robotics in architectural design and construction. The last part of the work that I'm showing now is will be focused on the development of intuitive making processes. Um, this is a part that uh, we started exploring recently and um, we think that it's a very, very, it becomes very, very crucial, especially today when we, topics of um, diversity and inclusivity are uh, becoming more and more important and also because of the pandemic and the difficulties and challenges that we face because of that. So augmented textures is this project and it's a proposal for another public art competition. Uh, it's a physical installation that augments visitor senses through a playful integration of colors and layers patterns and it aims to create an illusion of texture through layering and repetition. So in the virtual world, the texture is activated and users can control its growth through an app. Um, I don't know if this video is going to play very well because it's really heavy, but uh, I hope so. Um, so the installation consists of four nested cubes that create a multi-layer colorful translucent space that gives the impression of a textured fibrous material. So as you zoom in the digital model, you see that you can start identifying basically these very simple lines and layers that when you zoom out, it becomes more of like a textural, hairy structure. The structure is made out of four layers of net fabric that is mounted in a steel frame, so it's really basic. A, the pattern is printed on each layer of the fabric, each time in a different color, and the overlay of all of these translucent layers of printed net creates the sense of texture and tangibility. So we see how from one single line uh, that is rotated in different angles, all 2D, just by overlapping several layers of those, we can create something that is much more textural and three-dimensional. So this is a series of patterns that we did to investigate uh, different iterations from 3D to, to from 2D to 3D. Uh, and the final pattern starts from a very simple straight curve. Um, it's multiplied and rotated in different directions. And then the different colors enhance this visual depth and they result in the illusion of a very dense surface. Openings are introduced by cutting out primitive shapes out of the nets. And these openings reveal to the visitors also these kind of like separate layers and create visual contact between interior and exterior. Now the idea was that the texture would be augmented through uh, an AR app that visitors can use by scanning the structure with their smartphones. And with this app, they could change colors and create kind of like a more dynamic structure that interacts with their senses. Um, 
the app blurs the boundaries between physical and virtual and we had like a series of questions that we raised um, thinking about what is actually tangible, what is tangible when we are in a virtual space, um, what is visible, what can be actually sensed. And we were just trying to figure out if we can basically perceive materials and textures and or like change the perception of materials and textures just by simply rotating uh, straight lines. And now that's the last project I will show from our practice before moving a bit into teaching. Um, and this is a speculative project um, for a competition that was uh, actually published by Design. And um, the question was, how should the future urban home be? So that's a very, very broad question. And, and our response to that was that the future urban home should provide a dignified space, first of all, for each person, and also ideally provide a space that expresses their individual needs and identities and offer personalized design solutions. And we call those homes personalized creative capsules. So these capsules, you can see here, they provide space and facilities to help people design and fabricate their own homes. Um, although they have a very small footprint, they have the potential to expand and adapt to people's needs. And in our urban scenario, the capsule is basically divided into two main areas, the design and fabrication space. So in the design space, a projected interface uses machine learning to understand people's tastes and preferences and propose design solutions for their needs. And in the fabrication space uh, that is equipped with collaborative robots, they can prototype chosen designs and fabricate their own homes on site as an extension of this little capsule. Each person gets to design and build its own home following projected instructions and collaborating with the mobile robots. The home emerges out of a constant dialogue between the humans and the machines, and this dialogue aims to spark human imagination and empower people by giving them the tools to define their own space. Um, our ambition was that each person ends up with a unique personalized home that expresses their unique character, their aesthetics, their style, and their needs. And that this home would create a more vibrant, more vibrant, adaptable neighborhoods that are part of a different urban future. Uh, for us, this urban future would use technology to enhance human creativity and make everyone actually feel at home. Uh, so now I would like to also show some of our work as educators and talk about how this is related to our practice. Um, I think it's always an interesting uh, situation and an interesting discussion on how teaching and practice kind of like works together or ideally would like to work. This is a workshop that we gave at um, Chalmers University in Sweden as part of um, a conference in 2018. The objective of the workshop was to explore the potential of robotic technology to assemble lightweight wooden structures without using any scaffolding through a collaborative workflow between robots and builders and um, an integration of and an understanding of material properties and construction sequences. So we constructed a wall prototype made out of wood shingles using these two robotic arms. You see here the material system, uh, it's these wood shingles um, that have different dimensions and they are assembled in an additive manner. Um, the shingles were nailed together using a, a staple gun effector that we made for that project. So here you can see the two effectors. Uh, when I say effector, I mean the end tool that is mounted on the head of the robot. So you can see that there is one active and one passive effector. The active one is the one on the left, is the one that is picking up 
the, the shingles and staples them using uh, an integrated vacuum gripper and the pneumatic nail gun. And the other one is a passive one. It's basically a piece of wood that is offering support while the other robot, robot is stapling. And there is kind of like a construction sequence and collaborations between the two robots, the active and the passive one. So the collaborative workflow of this project allowed for the use of minimal scaffolding, making such a structure more material efficient. This is another workshop that we gave at the Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok, uh, where together with the students, we developed a wall system made out of bent plywood. So the pieces were cut in CNC and then bent against each other in order to create a curved form. The students investigated several patterns from 2D to 3D. They first started using paper and then gradually moving to plywood. And of course, one of the biggest challenges was understand the difference in material properties and see how they can scale up their prototypes when they moved from paper to uh, actual plywood. So our workshops are usually very hands-on. Um, this is the time for us to experiment with the students and test new ideas out. Um, sometimes things work out pretty well and we're very excited about that. And some other times they do not. Um, and this is part of the learning process and you know, the process of uh, testing new things that you, you're just starting um, discovering. And although usually in this workshop, this time, the time is very limited, um, there is this kind of like intensive character of workshops that we really enjoy because it allows us to work all together as a team, uh, get to know each other and start becoming creative and innovative and much less scared to try new things out than, you know, what you usually might be afraid of. These workshops give us this opportunity to be a bit more free and flexible and more risky. And, and finally, I would like also to show some work from the classes that I'm teaching this year at Carnegie Mellon. Um, this is kind of like under a bigger umbrella of my research there um, that I call Technopop. Uh, Technopop architecture aims to push new technological media, robotics, virtual reality, uh, AR, towards more approachable and human designs that engage the public and promote inclusivity uh, and accessibility through playful forms and colors and patterns. And you can see here the goals of this system, which is, you know, democratization of design, uh, accessibility of technology, civic engagement and empowerment using these innovative tools, expression of human diversity in the urban environment and broadening um, the idea of aesthetics in architecture, trying to make the whole design a bit more inclusive. So in this project called Box City, Will and Yang created um, a game that makes a comment on the fact that during the pandemic, the online orders of products that we buy were massively increased, ending up in a pile of cardboard boxes uh, for each household. Um, so in this game, players can add their boxes to create this kind of like collective outdoor virtual structures in their neighborhood. Um, they can customize their boxes and place them wherever they like into these um, structures. And they can also kind of like, after they add the boxes you see here in the interface, they can go and walk around and explore uh, what is happening in the neighborhood and in other neighborhoods. Um, the idea is that you can start understanding how many products and what kind of products are consumed um, in your neighborhood and maybe start becoming a bit alarmed about this fact. Um, in the end, there is this kind of like um, scoring interface where um, you can see 
how many uh, how much waste basically each neighborhood has and but also what kind of products do they buy and where do they buy them from because that was also something that um, they were very interesting in what kind of brands is it like only Amazon card boxes do they support local economy and local businesses um, so there was this kind of like fun environment where you could start actually seeing what is happening uh, and hopefully be a bit more skeptical and a bit more critical next time that you're going to place one more order and have one more cardboard box from Amazon at home. Here are some screenshots of this interface that was developed um, and how that would work as an AR game uh, in the physical world and some collages where they were brainstorming about how that would actually be in very different environments. So in, in big cities where everyone is ordering so much uh, and in smaller ones uh, where people maybe, you know, shop and locally or they consume less products. Another project from the same class was called Nativism. Um, my students, Kirsten and Seeking, in this case, explored the possibility of using the act of knitting as a virtual social activity. So they created a video game using a machine learning platform called Teachable Machine to track users knitting objects. So I'm, I'm showing you this video because Teachable Machine is something that is already online. It's not something that um, you have to actually, you know, uh, be an expert in machine learning to do. It's actually very intuitive. Um, and we always try to use in the classes um, software and platforms that exist already um, and uh, combine them in creative ways in order to achieve our um, projects and, and, and how we conceive our ideas. So this is the environment that they designed that allows players to design collectively this kind of like needed world, but also like communicate multiplayers with each other and comment on each other's designs. Um, this is their video. I think you can see a bit better, understand how it works a bit better in their video. Um, so you uh, create an account, you enter into this environment and um, you will start seeing already existing designs by other players that have already placed um, into this world. And um, you can uh, choose your location and start knitting your own object, or you can explore and understand how other users um, design this kind of like weaving structures. And then after you define a location, you start playing with a zip tie and by playing with this zip tie and using this platform that I talked about before, Teachable Machine, you can start basically create 3D virtual objects that you can then start adding in your uh, in the location that you want it. Um, I think an interesting part of this project was also this kind of like um, social media almost platform that we're introducing when um, users can comment and like or dislike other people's design and kind of like have um, a discussion about that and even have winners and um, the winners maybe could have actually their designs made like because they're all kind of like zip tie structures you would just uh, send them a kit. The idea was that you would send them a kit of zip ties and then they could even fabricate it. You can see this kind of like interface here. Um, so to summarize our work in our teaching, um, in general, we are interested and fascinated about uh, speculating the future of design and make and um, we're always excited about using innovative tools and techniques to explore the way we inhabit spaces and the impact that these spaces might have in the human experience so our material investigations include studies in material assemblies textures colorations patterning techniques both in physical and in the virtual world, 
And these investigations are usually coupled with advanced digital tools such as user interfaces, augmented and virtual reality, and advanced uh, manufacturing techniques um, to develop future scenarios for urban living and some platforms of physical and digital interactions that demystify technology and augment the role of human intuition in the design process. So yeah, that was it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, thank you Kiki. Thank you. Uh, very inspiring and uh, interesting presentation. I have a couple of questions before opening maybe a discussion in case somebody somebody else would uh, would also want uh, to um, ask. Uh, first thing, um, you very nicely kind of started with uh, with a, with a sort of agenda or sort of uh, field of interest of your studio, which included the democratization of uh, the uh, technology and uh, the intuitional kind of approach to to the design and collaboration. Uh, so I'm, I wanted to ask how how feasible or how difficult um, it is for. Um, young architect or young studio, a new studio with uh, the pressure of the market uh, and uh, the pressure of the, uh, well, uh, the existential pressure sort of to actually be able to um, work within a given agenda or field of interest. Yeah, it is challenging. It is challenging. It's not something that, um, it's not something that makes if you see your practice as business very successful, very fast. Um, I think for us, what we do, and actually I didn't mention that, I should have mentioned that, for most of our projects, we do collaborate with actual software developers. Um, so it's not that we're trying to do everything. First of all, it's something that, uh, especially if you wanna have a product as an end result, like an actual, app that is going to be out in the market it's uh we always collaborate with professionals that is really really important um so and, and usually these these professionals have an architectural background as well um so we can communicate very easily um so we definitely depend on that a lot and and we enjoy these collaborations that a lot because it's really hard as i said before to have like a very professional result um if you're not um an actual software developer so that is something that is very helpful and we're always looking forward to because we learn a lot through these discussions. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I think it is challenging, but at the same time helpful, um, especially because we are also interested in, in teaching and in education because this somehow one thing informs the other. So although it might be very time consuming and, you know, it's not something that is being asked, right? So like when we did the project in Frederick, like our latest one, no one asked us to make uh, an app. This was all extra things that we thought it would be interesting and good for the citizens to have this opportunity uh, to also during the pandemic explore that virtually. So these are all extra things basically that um, we've been doing. Uh, but I think, you know, also, the more you do, you educate yourself, you educate the clients, uh, and, you know, hopefully more of our clients are going to be asking for it at some point, I hope. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, that, that, I mean, for me, uh, I'm also trying um, to, to uh, work uh, besides teaching to, to work in a, in a studio and uh, for me to, it's one of the most inspirational things I, th I see about your work to, to keep focus on, on kind of your field of uh, interest. Uh, you mentioned um, the teaching and uh, I wanted my, with my second question to refer to that. Um, uh, while it is I guess possible to, 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 to maybe generalize a bit that, that at least the projects which you've shown related to teaching uh, maybe were more, um, most of them were uh, maybe more concerned with uh, materialization and fabrication and um, the practice uh, projects or the other projects maybe more explored uh, the, the uh, collaborative part and the um, use of apps and uh, using uh, or integrating people into, into the process of design. But still there, there was obvious um, 
obvious relation of the of, of these two two um, spheres uh, of your activities. So, uh, how do you feel? Uh, is it um, is it more that the, your practice uh, defines your teaching, or uh, or your teaching influences your practice, or it's vice versa? It's a. Uh, it, I, I don't know what I don't know what it is, but it also it's not constant for sure. So there are periods like this year, for example, because I had this position at Carnegie Mellon that was kind of like a full time position, both teaching and research. I think teaching and research was pushing more. Um, also because of time issues, right? Because um, we need to talk about the two because it's not just, um, you know, hobbies that we have, it's actual time that we spend. So when you work full time for a school and you do research there and, and you teach a lot there, you don't have a lot of time to actually take on new projects for your studio. But at the same time, you grow uh, kind of like professionally because of all this research that you're doing. So when, for example, in the summer, we do have more time usually because we don't have, I don't have any teaching, then I can focus back on that and try to see like what kind of projects can we do with the practice for teaching. Uh, but there are also other years, like the year before that I was teaching less. I was uh, in Brooklyn at Pratt and I was teaching part time and then I had more time to do these two projects that I showed you. So it really depends on, you know, kind of like the path that you follow. And for me, it's always kind of like one kind of like dragging me more or less at specific periods of time. It also has to do with kind of like uh, financial security. And I think that's also important to bring it up because when you are teaching, you have this kind of like security, right? Especially being in the U.S. that, um you are being uh, basically covering your expenses, even like your business expenses through teaching. So there's also this part. So sometimes you need to be teaching more and have less projects. Sometimes you can uh, teach less and then be a bit more risky and see how many projects you can get. So there is this back and forth. So these are the more practical parts, right? Now, conceptually, um, I don't know. I think there is, for me, there is a very good balance between the two. Um, when I work with my students and we develop projects and ideas, of course, I think I'm very influenced by the work that I'm doing and the way I'm teaching is really connected to what I'm actually doing in the practice. But at the same time, sometimes students can surprise you and they can inspire you so much. And then, you know, with their project, they open up your mind. And then from that, you know, endless possibilities basically come out. Um, I think that's the beauty of it. Thank you. That was uh, that, that uh, correlates with my my thoughts a lot, actually. Uh, Imro, uh, I see you are uh, having a question. Yes, uh, thank you for very inspiring and, and strong lecture. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm always interested in a comparison between the U.S. and European. Uh, yeah. Experience because your background is European and now you settled up in the US. So congratulations to be able to do this because uh, I, I, I trust to uh, US opportunity system much more than the European. But I'm just asking uh, how you can uh, uh, how you can. Uh, how you like to compare that those mm -hmm. environments and uh, etc. It is different. Um, I was actually very surprised when I arrived um, here and I was looking mostly for teaching jobs at the point to see how interested everyone was for someone that was coming from Europe and from the schools that I was coming from. Um, I was actually kind of like concerned in the beginning that, you know, I don't have American education. I don't come from an Ivy League school. And how would that be perceived or welcomed? But um, I felt the exact opposite, that it was actually a strong, uh, a strong kind of like part that I played, that I had a different background and they did appreciate that. At the same time, they they are always pushing here and looking, usually, at least they're trying to uh, look for a diversity of people um, that are teaching and they're working with. And I felt that um, 
being not being American and being a woman was actually something desired there. Um, and I had a lot of opportunities, plus the fact that being young there um, is not considered necessarily inexperienced, which is the case. Of course, you have less experience, but at the same time, it's considered kind of like, you know, fresh ideas, new things, innovative things. So I felt that all of the all of these things played a big part in the fact that I was so welcomed. I felt very welcomed when I arrived here. So these were some things that I think that um, also kept me here and that um, I really I really did enjoy to see that when I arrived. Now, when it comes to education, it either, either have a very different system. I think we should not uh, ignore the fact that American school, most good American schools have very high tuition fees. Um, so um, it's really uh, intensive for the students because they have this pressure on top of the pressure of their studies of um, actually uh, paying a lot for their education. So that is a part that when I started teaching here, I saw that is very different from the approach that we had in the schools that I was studying in Europe. So there's a different kind of pressure there and different kinds of approach for your studies. Um, and everything is much more intense and intensive and students are very hardworking, but very stressed out at the same time. Um, but it's a different approach and, and you can see that very fast. Um, now, when it comes to work, um, I do think that there are a lot of opportunities here that uh, at least before the pandemic, things were growing and we're moving. And I think there are opportunities for uh, younger people to innovate. But it is definitely challenging for, um, you know, a, a European moving here and settling down and um, getting their papers done and everything. It was that was a challenging part for sure. Are you colleagues with Dava Kupkova? Kupkova? Yes, yeah. yes, we're in the same. I mean, it's weird now because of COVID, we don't go to school, so we've met online, but we haven't met in person. Uh, we're all in our apartments, but yes. Okay. Oh, say hello to her. Thank you. I think there is another question from our guest. Hi, um, first of all, I want to say it was very, presentation was very inspired. I have um, a question. Uh, did the pandemic affect your project? And how do you think the COVID will affect on the public environment from the design aspect? I'm studying um, interior and furniture design, um, and this subject is very interested me about the future. So, yeah. Thank you for this question. Uh, it's a very good question. Well, first of all, it did have an impact um, in the projects that we had already started that were all paused. Some of them were canceled. The thing is that we work with public structures, outdoor structures usually. So, and, and usually these are either temporary or permanent and the ones that are especially temporary that are the ones that we can get easier. Um, they are for festivals and events and all of these things were canceled. So uh, everything that was about to happen in the summer, it just didn't happen. Uh, and maybe they will happen this year, but no one can really guarantee. So we had a lot of uh, projects that were paused or delayed. Um, but I think at the same time, for us, it was also interesting, an interesting challenge to see, you know, to, to kind of like reconsider our work and say, OK, we are working in public space and public space is being transformed right now. Uh, people have a completely different approach towards that. People are afraid to be in public. They're afraid to touch things. And we're going and we're going to place basically an installation there that people are supposed to interact with. So like, how do you design something uh, that maybe doesn't even feel safe? Um, and I think that changes a lot. We are, I think the, the fact that we do a lot of like uh, virtual things helps. And I think these tools are becoming more and more important. AR, VR, things that you can experience safely at home while being socially distant. Um, 
even like, you know, these kind of like platforms as Zoom, as uh, uh, Microsoft Teams have gained insane value. So using and understanding how to use these tools became even more important now. Uh, and I do think that, yeah, there's there there are going to be changes. There are going to be things that are going to be left um, even when this is going to be over. But at the same time, I, I, I'm interested in this kind of like transition period, to be honest with you. Um, I'm interested in this transition when we have all of this trauma right now as a society, as a planet, and how do we heal that? Um, I'm, I'm optimistic that this is going to end at some point, but it's not only the actual um, health issues. There also a lot, there's a lot of like emotional and psychological trauma after being so long under these conditions. And I'm interested in the transitional period of how do you start healing that? How do you encourage people and make them feel safe to be out in this world again? And, and how do you do that? with like physical installation, virtual installations, um, how do you kind of like encourage them to come and, and talk to each other again and see them again and, and look at each other again and play with structures? And, and we think that playing in general is something that can help, kind of like playful um, processes can be something intuitive for people to come out again. But this is something that we're just thinking about right now, and we're waiting to see how the situation is going to be evolved and, and when we're going to be ready for that. Uh, but I'm I'm really personally interested in this transitional period of um, kind of like trying to overcome all of this shock that we've been through uh, through our designs. And and if you are like interior and furniture, I think that is also becoming extremely important. How do we design interior spaces right now? How do we understand the relationship between, you know, what is happening in interior space, what is happening in the public space? Um, how much time now do we spend in our interior homes right now? And we do everything there. Uh, how, for me, questions of like, how can I not, you know, be extremely bored and suffocated in my apartment when I'm always there? How can I create some experiences that are, that help me kind of like um, change or like transform a few things so that it's not a constant environment that I'm experiencing? It's, it's, it's important. Um, and, and I think these are things that if I was an interior designer, I would think about a lot. I'm like, how can I create an environment where someone can stay for the whole day, do all of these different things, but at the same time not feel suffocated? Uh, they're huge questions. And, and I think because remote working is going to be popular for a long time afterwards, I hope so, um, these things are going to stay. It's not something that temporal. I think uh, we're going to keep on working from home a lot. We're going to keep on working remotely. So you know, I was talking about personalization of, of space, for example, right? How do we personalize our space? How do we create a space that is unique for our needs? And, and I think um, we're all kind of like brainwashed with a lot of kind of like Instagram interior design. And that is not actually what might be expressing our needs and expressing our aesthetics and our style and our cultural kind of like identity. So I think these are things that we should think about and give uh, people the opportunity and the tools and the furniture and the designs to actually express themselves and, and create kind of like an identity for their space that they spend so much time in right now. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, somebody is asking for. Uh, I cannot see who is it. Yeah, it's it's actually me. Ah, yeah. So, uh, thank you, thank you for your presentation. Very inspiring work. Um, I'm always thinking uh, out of my own experience uh, how other people uh, see this. Um, in my experience, there is a huge difference between. Uh, creating a design that is not about to be built and a design that is actually going to be built. Um, 
even more when it's uh, all, all about uh, the digital fabrication tools or even even the the games the the mobile games that you actually produce and apps it is very different to create something for yourself and for the use of, of the people who are familiar with the project uh, in comparison with making something completely public making something that that people need to uh, interact with in the case of apps and in and to actually really build something out of real materials. And I'm not only talking about um, the availability and and, um, and the actual machinery, but also the fact that, that the things, they have certain weight, they, uh, the materials, they have certain thickness and, and properties, and maybe you need to put a screw somewhere where you don't fit your hand and, and so on. So um, I would really like to hear your take on this and how do you see the, this, uh, distinction between making a design and building the thing and when do you really start thinking about how to make the thing so that it, it, you don't suffer when building it? <laughs> well, you always suffer when building it. I don't know. I don't have any other way, but uh, there are always surprises. What I like doing is um, when we know that we got it. I mean, of course, when we have competitions, um, we still try to collaborate with uh, fabricators that we know and we've worked with before. So even when we're developing ideas, we might like just, you know, send an email and say, hey, we have this thing, you know, what do you think about this idea, about this connection and these materials that we're going to be using? And we do the same with the engineers that we collaborate with. We have very good relationships. So even like when we develop sometimes a competition idea, we might send an email, just, you know, very, very broad Concepts still just, as you said, like materials and connections, uh, and that is already helpful. And we do that, and after we get a project, hopefully, then uh, we engage the fabricators very early on, um, and we try to collaborate with them very closely. Um, we've been very lucky with that. We, for some reason, they are also very happy to work with something that maybe is very different than what they usually do. For example, for the project in downtown Frederick, we had a very good collaboration with a, a metal fabricator that usually, you know, they would do like hand, ra hand railing, uh, different kind of like public uh, signage and things like that. And this time that was kind of like public art, they were very happy to collaborate, like really excited about the project. So we would work with them very closely, very early on to see what kind of challenges we would have. Uh, that doesn't mean that we didn't have challenges on site. Um, we did, um, but I think that's also part of the process. I don't know. I've never been in a case, especially when you're trying to do something a bit different, that you don't have any issues. So it's kind of like in the schedule. We always also kind of like include a couple of days more because we know we will have to troubleshoot for something. Um, but I think, yes, talking with actual fabricators and engineers very early on and not giving them a final design, but kind of like giving them a sketch and let them know that, you know, we're open to adapt that according to your thoughts. It's very, very important. I think that is what saves us. Now, yeah, it's true that when it's a virtual, a completely virtual project, you don't have these issues. But I realized very early on when we started with this kind of like VR, AR things, that there are other challenges there, technical ones that I couldn't even think about because I'm not a software developer. So, for example, when we were doing the project in LA and we were designing the VR interface, um, I was uh, I, I designed kind of like the interface and I, I thought like you know you're going to like wear the goggles and the interface is going to be there. But actually there is so much science behind that on like, how do you position that so that you don't get dizzy so that it becomes intuitive. So the actual developer really helped us kind of like understand all of these technical issues that we didn't even know about. Um, but again, like we try to bring a professional in the team very early on to help us with that. Thank you. If there are any uh, questions, please feel free to ask. This uh, is a great opportunity.
maybe uh, again, uh, if, if I may, um, how do you, uh, it's about, it's, uh, I'm going to ask about the feedback on your work, but I'm not really uh, that much curious mm -hmm. whether people like it. I'm pretty sure they do like it. Uh, what I would like to ask is how do you collect uh, feedback and if you do that and if you're interested and what sort of feedback uh, do you find um, important? And I'm mainly asking uh, because you do both. You, you do architecture and design and at the same time you do computer apps. And with the computer apps, there is a there is a certain routine how the developers are collecting the telemetry and all the information about how many people use uh, the app, which features are being popular, and so on. And and there is uh, there is a science behind. And um, for for the big software studios, this is a very important decision uh, making uh, data uh, data that they use uh, when they make certain decisions. And um, we. In, in architectural domain, we are not that much. Uh, uh, we don't use these sophisticated feedback tools so much. But maybe I was wondering uh, if if we do both uh, the the software and the the design. Uh, do you somehow care about the feedback and collect it intentionally? And um, oh, that's such a good question. Uh, actually, uh, I'm very interested in that. In general, not like only as a feedback, like we do something and then we get feedback. I'm, I'm, I'm even more interested in more kind of like participatory processes and how we can revise them today. So it's something that maybe we haven't done that yet. We didn't have the opportunity. I hope at some point uh, we will manage to have a project that includes kind of like communicating community engagement. So you get feedback during the design process, not after you find what you have out there. So it's like either, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down, but it's more productive and it actually has an impact in the work. So that would be something that I would really like to have the opportunity to do at some point to get a project that allows us to do that. Um, on the other hand, what we do now, it's true, um, The we don't do it uh, ourselves, but yes, the people that we collaborate with that they do develop the the apps do get some feedback, and they did have to uh, release like a new version at some point so that it's a bit more robust. But that is usually very technical. I'm mostly interested in the more kind of like uh, intuitive feedback that someone would just comment something on Instagram, for example. Uh, I don't underestimate the power of that, but also the importance of that and the significance of that. I don't think that is just, okay, you know, it's just social media, you don't care. I think there is truth being said and there is power to that. I do try to catch up with comments and it's not that we always get good feedback. That's the, the crazy part about making public installations. Uh, you get you get comments that you would never imagine before and then and some of them you're like yeah you, you you're probably right right we didn't even think about that for the next project hopefully we're gonna take that into account but especially when we worked for the latest one that was like a very small city is a very kind of like small community there uh, that they do love this city very, very much. They are people that kind of like were born there and grew up there and their parents were there and like they know everything, every little spot of this small city. Uh, you see that uh, they are really engaged, like they do have feelings about that. I think if it was something probably in Brooklyn or New York City, a lot of people would just ignore. But when it's in a smaller community, they really do care about what is going to be out there. How does it respond to the site? Do they think it's respectful? Do they think it's got something that is offensive? Uh, and I think that's really, really beautiful to see that people care, uh, even if it's like for negative comments, but they do care. Um, and it makes you feel that, you know, your work is important and what you're doing, people actually care about. So that is great, even if it's negative, at least like, you know, they care, they don't like walk by and they don't even turn their heads. Um, and we did get very positive feedback. I think what is interesting in public art um, that we discovered now is that people are very used to having something very figurative. Uh, something very kind of like, you know, a statue or something that represents something. So when they see something abstract, they are very, uh, they're excited, especially the younger ones, but also like they may not really understand why it is there. So we did get a lot of feedback on like, 
what is that? What does this mean? Does it mean something? Does it look like something? And we're like, you know, it doesn't look like something necessarily, but if it looks like something for you, it's great. Like, you can look like whatever you want. Um, so people interpret this kind of like more abstract structures in very different ways. Um, but yeah, I think for, for, for me, of course, checking feedback is really important, but having feedback during the process would have been much more meaningful, actually. One more question from my side. Your your enthusiasm is showing the power of girl. I'm asking why the men's work is losing the power in the work of architecture. Uh, if you look at the at Yale, Princeton, Columbia, Rice University, all those universities, all those university, uh, uh, have uh, female uh, deans. Uh, the most number of the students are female in the universities, and also females. Females taking the power in the world of architecture. Why it is especially in the in the time when technology and uh, and uh, new technologies. Uh, are more important than before. It, it doesn't mean that the architecture is less important. Uh, why does this happen? I don't know. You should tell me. I don't know what has happened, uh, what happened in the past. And it's true that we were very underrepresented. All of me as a student um, in the university, that you know, because also of, of Telios, um, we did have a, the, the majority of students were female. Um, so there were women studying, and then I don't know what happens afterwards. I think um, life happens, and um, if you are, if you do have family and you do have kids and you have no support or anyone helping you, it's just impossible to manage both. Um, so there are very practical issues. I think the, there is no support and there is no encouragement, and but there are a lot of expectations of you managing to do both. And uh, you might feel that you have to and that this is your responsibility, uh, but it is not. And you're not supposed to. And it's not easy and it's not achievable. That's why we, we, you don't manage, not because it's your problem, but it's, it's not achievable. Simple as that. It's way too hard. So I think that is why we see a lot of women students, but then we see less and less um, in the profession. Uh, and especially when you climb up the ladder, right? Because you don't get the opportunity to get promoted that easily. The wages that we get are uh, significantly significantly uh, lower than uh, our male colleagues of the same level. So it is happening. It is true, though, that there is a wave here. And in the U.S., a lot of deans and academics uh, in very high positions are female right now. And they do great. Uh, which is great for all of us behind. And they do try a lot to bring women in school. So at Pratt, for example, the dean um, there, um, Harriet Harris, is really pushing for that and is really trying to do so. Uh, and, and that is bringing a lot of change. Now, the fact that um, technology is in the game, I don't know how that has an impact on um, the, the fact that women are more represented today. I think that for me, I can talk about myself, I guess. Uh, for me personally, it started more of a ch as a challenge, as a personal challenge, as something that when you are kind of like, uh, w w when it's assumed or like suggested that you're probably not going to be good at it, maybe um, you become a bit more um, willing to try it and, and prove yourself. So I think it started a bit like that, trying to prove myself there. And then it just became, uh, you know, a, a very kind of like personal passion uh, that I, I love doing. But it started more, I think, as this kind of like personal challenge that I wanted to kind of like prove that this can be done um, and we can do kind of like very good, great job as well. But there is a great community in when it comes into computational design and architecture, uh, digital 
tools and, and, and robotics. There's a very strong community of women there that actually do support each other a lot. Um, and they do a great job. Um, I feel very kind of like um, lucky to be in this network. And I know that, you know, they are out there and they see what is happening and they call out people. If, you know, they see some events where there's no woman invited, they will call them out and they would push for having kind of like equal representation. So I think this very strong network of women, which is not something formal, it's not deans of schools, it's something very informal and, and very formal network and connection of community of people and women um, helps a lot. At least here, I see it a lot. I think it exists in Europe as well. But unfortunately, as you also mentioned in Europe, uh, the representation is not as equal as in the US right now. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I personally would like to believe that uh, technological adv advancement uh, brings, or at least should bring, a fair, more fair world in, in all aspects. Sometimes it doesn't, but I think it should. And uh, let's hope that the, one of these fair aspects would be the more equal representation of all uh, genders, also not genders, but also um, any kind of groups. Exactly. It's not just genders. It's not just genders. It's like inclusivity in general, inclusivity of uh, race, of different kind of professions even that maybe are underestimated. And um, just having more accessible processes and more inclusive processes. And I think these tools do help a lot for that if they're used you know, intentionally the right way. Uh, maybe I would ask if there is one last question uh, for the public. Anybody? Uh, okay, then I would like again to thank you a lot for, it was very inspiring for me, very interesting presentation. I hope for everybody uh, who, who participated enjoyed. Um, I hope uh, the, this is an opportunity how we can um, in the future also keep in touch and maybe collaborate uh, professionally as well. Um, as uh, Imro has mentioned, this is the start of uh, the series of lectures, so I hope all uh, who participated today and uh, uh, maybe uh, I, also some more people would join us also in the future. The, uh, there is a schedule which is a little bit irregular, but we will be reminding you, so don't worry. Yes, uh, send some invitations, please. Definitely we will, we will, and uh, will be great to have you also. Hopefully, uh, most of the most of the lectures are planned uh, at about the same time as now, so it should be a little bit accessible for United States as well. Uh, not in the middle of the night. Yeah, I know, I know, but we are used to it now. Everyone being all over the place, to having students being in China, in Europe right now, we're all kind of like always working. It's even worse than before. But thank you so much for for having me. It's it's a pleasure. I I really like the work that you're doing, all the efforts that you're putting into like having a school that is so extroverted. You bring very very big diversity of people in. I think it's really really inspirational and and really really kind of like motivating for your students to see all of this big diversity of work over there. Uh, thank yeah. you. Some more. I, I just I just wanted to suggest uh, that I already said that, but let's let's say it really aloud. It would be really awesome if uh, if you could also join us for for the upcoming lectures, and we will keep telling that to everybody. And uh, maybe at the end of uh, each each lecture and presentation, we can have a little chat uh, among yes. all the guests, and and maybe also share uh, the knowledge and experience, and and keep the network growing. Uh, if it's not possible on the really personal basis, this is the most personal we can get in this time. And uh, it would be awesome to, to see you again uh, at, at the, the upcoming lecture that we are going to Yes, do. it would be great to have some discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for attending. I know it's a very challenging semester for everyone. Good luck with your projects and everything. Good luck. It's still morning there? Yeah. Yes, still morning. morning so I have a whole day ahead. <laughs> have a good evening.